as a currency in Europe, you will see the, the euro survive. There is no doubt about that. If you look back, the European Union is just about 50 years old. It's not very old. It's very, very, very recent. But still in these 50 years, we have achieved peace on the continent. We have exported democracy with our enlargement. It is something that is now taken for granted in most of the European Union countries. We know very well that this was not the case not so many years ago. This is something that is a major achievement and it is around the world praised as such. We have democracy, rule of law and prosperity. And the European Union is still attracting new members. As you have perhaps heard, Croatia is the latest that has signed an accession treaty just in December. It's going to join, if everything goes well, on the 1st of July 2013, when we will be 20, 28 countries. There are more countries in former Yugoslavia that are waiting to, uh, to accede to the European Union. There's also Turkey, which is a case apart because it's a very big country that also wants to join the European Union. So the European Union hasn't lost anything of its force of attraction. There are still countries that want to join. When I look at the, at the major achievements over these 50 years, well, first of all, there is the, what we call the common market. We call the abolition of borders for the transfer, for the movement of people, of goods, of capitals and services. You probably have heard about that. You know that when you go from one country in, to another country in the European Union, you don't need to show your documents, your passports, you just cross into the next country and it's all very easy. Same thing for goods that you sell, that you buy, you know that you can sell them and buy them at the same, they have to uh, qualify for the same technical standards all across the European Union. That's what we call the internal market. If you make a, a, if you make a payment online or not online, from Belgium to Italy, it's treated as a domestic payment. It's not an international payment. It's not like a wire, a wire transfer that I have to make to another continent or country. It's considered a domestic one. So these are the, the freedoms, what we call the, free, the, the four freedoms of people, services, capital, and goods. And this is a major achievement, again, of the European Union. So we have peace, we have the, the free market, the free free area of circulation, the single market. And then the next big achievement was the euro. And it still is a major achievement for us, the common currency. And from the outset, this was not an economic project alone. It was not done on the basis of mathematical calculations, economic calculations only. It was from the outset also a political project. It was very important for us to share also the, cu the currency. It makes sense because most of the trade is intra-European trade and it makes sense to have the same currency so that you don't have currency fluctuations. It makes sense for the people who travel from one country to another. All these countries are very small compared to the United States. It's easy to move from one country to another and it's much easier to do this all with one currency. So it makes sense from that, but it also makes sense for comparison of prices. If you go, if you have now the euro everywhere, you know how much a car costs in Italy or in Germany or in France, and you can compare this easily. So it has also led to more harmonized common price levels. It has led to lower inflation, inflation across Europe. So there are many economic reasons that make it, that make sense for the euro, but there is also a political idea behind this. And this is very important for us because politically something that you cannot explain on, on economic reasons alone, why it is there and why we believe in it. So all this, 10 years ago when the euro was launched, these reasons were there. And we set up this, this uh, economic monetary union. And there was a focus more on the monetary union. And there was definitely a neglect for the economic union. And we are paying the price now. There was at the time we thought that it would be enough to have a harmonized a uni, a single monetary policy and the economic policies could still be left with the single member states. But we have seen that unfortunately this did not work out as well as we thought. And what happened at the time is that the countries 
the weaker countries came in into this economic union and the, the interest rates went down, inflation rates went down, and they could much easier get loans. And well, if it's easier to get money, very often you do overspend. <laughs> like in a family, if it's easy to have access to credit, credits, if that's made it much easier, you're more likely to make more investment, to, to spend more money. And this has not, uh, at a certain point, this is not sustainable anymore. So with the financial crisis that started here in the US a couple of years ago, it came over to Europe. And in the beginning, we thought, well, it will have an impact, but maybe not so bad. But it has become worse. And we are still working with the aftershock of this financial crisis in Europe. And this has made the, the financial problems that we had in Europe much more acute. And it is now about two years that we are trying to get out of this situation. But believe me, it is two years and it will take another maybe two years, but we are getting out of this. So it takes time, like if you look at the 50 years that it took to build up the European Union, two years is nothing. And if I look at American media that I read every day, and it's two years that the American media are saying, the, uh, Europe is now on the brink of collapse, the Euro is not going to survive and so on. We are still there. It's true that the American media also say, um, this is now another new meeting of the European Council, the European ministers, and if they don't get an agreement this time, then this is really it. We don't believe that the Euro will survive. Well, after two years of this kind of reporting, we are still there, we are still working on this, and we are actually putting together little pieces that will emerge as a global, as a, as a solution, as a coherent solution, how to get out of this crisis. And we don't focus only on the short term. We're not just looking what we need now to deal with Greece. We are, this, is not, this is just one aspect. We are not just looking at how big this firewall has to be, but we are also looking how we can actually implement structural changes in our economic systems in the European Union that take much more time, but that will have a much more positive longer term impact. So we are trying to get out of this crisis stronger by having more economic integration and more common structural policies. So we are, we are looking for structural changes. So when we deal with this crisis, we deal on the one hand with the short term issues, which is building up a firewall, having enough money there in a rescue fund that can come in to help Ireland as it did, to help Portugal and to help uh, Greece. But at the same time, we also look for our economic policies. How can we become more competitive? We have lost a lot of competitiveness, for example, in some countries in Europe, like in Italy. We are also looking on our labor laws, on our pension laws. All this, we are changing it. And I think if you look at the, over, the, over the last two years, we have achieved so much in those two years in terms of really concrete economic political changes that we haven't achieved probably the previous 20 years. So we have accelerated our action, our, our work to get out of this crisis very, very much. And I think uh, in America, and the financial markets in particular, you're always looking for a, a quick solution, for a quick fix. Well, unfortunately, you have no quick fix in this, solution, in this case. Because you do have 27 countries, you have 17 countries of the Eurozone, and they ha there are 17 different opinions and 20 or 27 different opinions. And because we are a democratic uh, institution where everybody has the same voice, we discuss this. But I mean, if you look last year, um, maybe you remember, I think it was in October, then we had another crisis summit in Brussels, and there was one. Um, one head of state or head of government, I should say, in Slovenia. And that was the last country that hadn't voted in favor of the rescue, budget for, uh, uh, rescue package for Greece. And that person actually resigned. So that person said, OK, for our country, it's better I resign and we have a positive vote for this because it's, in the, in, it's, in, in the, it's for the good of the whole of the European Union. So this kind of, of co-responsibility, this kind of solidarity, you, you, you have, I think it's difficult to find it elsewhere. 
Now, of course, a lot of the burden is now in Germany. It's the biggest contributor to the European Union budget. And it, takes, it will take time for them to really do what is necessary to come out for us, for the for whole of the European Union, to come out for, of the crisis. The same as it takes in Italy, with very difficult measures they have to take, in Greece, in Ireland, in Portugal, in Spain, and in the countries that are under fire. But these measures are being taken, it, and they will definitely be, it will definitely be done what is necessary to get out of this crisis and to save the euro. Because as I, and I come back to my initial point, the euro was a political project. It was not just an economic project. So we are really, we are really going now through the, the different steps, taking shorter measures so that we have this firewall, taking longer term measures, the structural changes that we need to make, and having more economic integration, this uh, economic union missing in the beginning with the economic and monetary union. So we are taking all these steps to get out from the crisis. Um, then when it says perspective, the perspective of the delegation. So here I wanted just to add a few things about our EU-US relationship and, um, and saying why this matters for the United States. I, as I said, we in Europe are living this aftershock of the financial crisis that started here a few years ago. Uh, in America, there were several measures were taken at the time and the years after, and we are still taking some of these measures uh, to, fight, to fight this crisis. Uh, the trade, if we, if we talk about the EU and US in terms of trade relationship, we have, I have here the figure, 4.28 trillion transatlantic dollars, transatlantic economic partnerships. So 4.28 trillion of dollars is, to, is it worth, our partnership. We create 15 million jobs on both sides. So it's, we are the biggest partner, economic partner for the United States. In terms of trade, we are the biggest market for the United States. In terms of import, we just come after China for the US. In terms of investment, if you, if you look at the investment, the, the investment of the United States in the EU is more than three times as much of what the US invests all in Asia. So like the investment of the European Union in the United States is more than eight times what we invest in India and in China. I mean, if you look at these figures, you will understand that this is the biggest economic partnership in the world. And because of our economies being so interlinked, any crisis that we have in Europe, or for that matter, any crisis that you have in the US, affects the other partner. In, in terms of investment, I mentioned the flows, but more and more companies invest through subsidiaries, affiliates, and even here in, in, in the area of Carolina, I see, for example, in Spartanburg, which is in South Carolina, BMW, the German car maker, invested five billion for a full manufacturing facility outside of, job, of Germany. So they created 7,000 jobs there. So with all, with all these links in the investment, in the trade field, in the trade field, Anything that happens here affects us, and anything that happens in Europe will affect you. And why, why we need to get out of this together? Well, precisely of that, because we, we need to do this together. There was some point, you know, thinking, yes, Europe, we have to blame Europe because our job uh, market here is not improving. It doesn't make sense to put this blame on either of us, you know. What we, what we really need to do is work together, create together many more jobs so that we can both get out of this crisis better. It's anything that is negative in Europe and would affect negatively the US, it doesn't make sense. It is, we are in this together, so either we swim together or we go <laughs> under together. And that is really, I think this cooperation is really, really essential. Um, in, in terms of, one more time, from the delegation, the perspective from the delegation, 
If I look at the American media reporting, it's very, very, very negative. It is, it is it's not just the euro that they put in, into question, but also the European integration process. But if you go to Europe and you read German, French, Italian, Slovenian media, you will see that nobody there puts the European integration process into question. Nobody. There are lots of debates of how we should bail out Greece, should we bail out Greece, uh, what should we do with the other countries, does it make sense to integrate our economic policies further and so on. All of these questions. But nobody puts into question the European integration. Because that's something for us which is, we take it now for granted, it's there, it's not going to change. We are happy with that. We want to go ahead on this, level, on the, on this path. So when I compare American media reporting and European media reporting, I see a big difference. The other thing that I wanted to say is that, of course, American reporters, because of the language issue, they rely very much on, on uh, British media because it's the same, the same language. So in American media, you don't have very often somebody from continental Europe, a native uh, uh, different language speaker speaking about what is happening in Europe. Most of the time you will have people who are from the United Kingdom and who speak about Europe. But as you know, perhaps the United Kingdom has a very special position within the European Union. And they give one part of the picture, but I wouldn't say it is complete unless you also have other people speaking from other continental European countries. So I don't want to say that the reporting is distorted, but I don't think it is complete. I think it would be good to have more reporters also from other countries in, in continental Europe speaking about the crisis and not just getting, getting one message that is filtered through the eyes of one member state. And another thing that I wanted to say that we also, um, Another um, challenge that we encounter in our communication efforts on the, on the economic crisis in Europe is actually that a lot of the debate here in America and a lot of the reporting is done uh, for domestic purposes. So what I mean by that is that you have some, some analysts, some commentators who have their own political agenda that is, that is really focused on the US. So it's actually they're making they're making a point by saying, well, Europe should have more stimulus measures, Europe should do some more quantitative easing and all this. But they are thinking, and they are writing this article, focusing on the American political scene. It's not, it's not about the reporting about Europe, but they are trying to use the arguments to actually make their point about the political debate here, the domestic debate. And Honestly, when we as communication people go out and speak with these journalists and with these commentators or with these economists, then very often they have their argument already very much, how should I say, that it's, it's very difficult to give them a different uh, perspective because they want to hear the figures that will support their point of view. And if they don't get the data that support their point of view, they are not interested. But because, they are, because they are, they are, their objective is not so much to report about the issue in Europe, how it is there, but more about how to influence the political debate here. And America and Europe is different. We cannot solve the crisis there the way it has been solved or is being solved here. So quantitative easing is not a policy that works in Europe the way it works here. There are different ways that we have to uh, go in Europe to come out of the crisis. So I wanted to explain, first of all, that the euro is going to stay, <laughs> that this is a political project, that this comes from 50 years of economic and, and integration in Europe that is not going to be cancelled or, or uh, stopped or anything like that with this two years crisis on the euro, that the euro is not just a political achievement for us, but it makes also economic sense. And that we are taking unprecedented measures, economic measures, to get out of this, which are long-term and short-term, and that eventually our economies will get out of this much stronger. 
It will be a very tough time. Austerity bites. We'll all have to live with less. But we are sure that we will manage, even if this takes time, and more time that unfortunately markets would like it to be, and we ourselves would like it to be much faster. But it's not going to happen. But what is sure that eventually, we will have done what is necessary to get out, to rewin the trust of the markets, and to be able to go uh, on with our European project. Thank you. So I'm ready for questions. <laughs>